Hi, folks. Welcome to another episode of Film Study. We're back for part two of our discussion on the defense with our friend Alec Pulianis of One Winning Pod. Alec, how are you doing? Doing great, Ken. Always good to talk football with you, even after a loss. Yep. I will say really good to have a Baltimore guy. Got Baltimore cap, gas him up Grayson's shirt looking at me <laughs> instead of some Yankee fan who's gonna, you know, not feel any <laughs> pity for the weekend we've just been through. We went all through a lot of that in week one in, in the first episode. I'd encourage people. Good discussion of the secondary. I'm sure we're going to overlap a little bit in terms of what we talk about in this episode with some individual performances, but big questions on what to do about this secondary going forward. And I think uh, the usage of Humphrey to me is something that's up in the air fairly early. It is. Yeah, it's it's unclear. I think the Ravens coaching staff has a lot of uh, inter- internal looking at themselves to say, what are we going to do with this personnel group? And we have, I mean, it's a, it's a good problem to have, but uh it's a problem. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a it's Bill James had a an interesting comment he used to make is the best leadership comes from the best players. So if you have if Mickey Mantle is your team leader, um, that's a good thing. OK, but and even with all the other baggage that came along with Mickey Mantle and hotel rooms and all the stuff that was in ball four, <laughs> it's a it's a it's mm-hmm. a good thing. When Rick Sutcliffe is your team leader and you're the 92 or 93 Orioles and Rick Sutcliffe is terrible, that's generally speaking, not a good thing. It, or, or it can become not a good thing because you have to get rid of the guy. And, you know, you, you, you end up with a, with a situation where your locker room might not be happy about getting rid of a guy who, you know, just isn't playing well. Usually players tend to understand underperformers getting cut, but you also don't want to be in a position where you have to cut a team leader and, and, uh, and do that anyway. So, Best leadership comes to the best players anyway. And so obviously some of the Ravens leaders came back in this game and they did not get it done on the field for the Ravens this time around. We spent a lot of time talking about that. Honestly, the the, the four players who are pretty much considered to be leaders, Beckham, Humphrey, Williams, and Stanley, were four of the guys who were front and center in terms of losing this football game. Yeah, they were. And it makes it really challenging going forward. Uh, you Stanley's the best guy you got. Um, We we talked that maybe Williams isn't at this moment. Mm -hmm. And then Humphrey, unclear. We'll see. It's hard to say. I I hate talking ill of Humphrey. Like it's, it it feels blasphemous, honestly, but you know, they had a tough game in in this one um, coming back from injury, obviously, and coming into a situation where the team has been performing quite well, maybe overperforming, but performing quite well. And it's going to, it's leading some interesting questions we have to talk about. So we covered it a lot in the first episode, but I'm sure we'll, we'll dabble in it a bit here. And, and to be fair, that could have been Ronald Darby out there at left cornerback on the 41 yard pass to Pickens. And if they oh, sure. draft up their safety to be a pass rusher, as they did, um, yeah. they brought, you know, they brought Williams up to the edge. Then, you know, you, you, you lose that anyway. And of course, Williams just didn't look like himself. And we talked about that in the first episode, please. Go down and love that. There's a lot of discussion there. I think it's really it's it's at a good level. It's as honest as I can make it. Um, I am not negative on how this defense performed overall, um, but you know, in two offensive players, two defensive players returned. I think it was an all hands on deck situation with the with the Ravens this week. I mean, Harbaugh was really pushing for it, and mm-hmm. the uh, uh, those four guys looked like they were all back a week early. Indeed. All right, let's let's uh, let's talk a little bit of individual players. As always, my guest, please <laughs> pick one. I'll refrain from the secondary for a bit and talk about uh, the defensive line. This is a, a group we didn't talk about too much. I felt like Pierce had a really good game. Um, I don't think he recorded a pressure per se, but I felt like he got a couple uh, opportunities in the backfield, and he seemed to be doing his job as a run stuffer. And I, I thought he and a lot of the other players on the defensive line had a really good game, just solid play um okay i so i have pressure for pierce for three separate pressures and oh, okay, I, th- great. I thought he was outstanding he's, he's yeah. one of the one of the best players no doubt about it uh three yard gain a four yard gain and a sack minus six he had the pressure that set up urban's hustle sack so urban mm-hmm. t- typical raven sack first guy <laughs> gets in moves the quarterback the second guy cleans up i mean that's that's what that's the raven's formula yeah in terms of getting somebody there and the first pressure guy really is is often the guy who does more on those plays. And Brent's a friend of the show. I'm sure he understands this. That was a, a great opportunity created by Pierce on that play. And it was just nice that he was in the right place at the right time to take advantage of it uh, and and you keep his motor going to do it. Uh, but I thought Pierce was terrific. Pierce has been standing up 
against double teams on the run. Uh, he's been consistently outstanding. Uh, we had good run notes for him on several different plays in this game uh, against the run. And unfortunately, there'll be no article this week. I wanted to mention that to folks because of the travel schedule, the Orioles schedule, and also the illness I'm dealing with here to try and get through. But uh, outstanding game from Pierce. And I, I, the, I, Maureen and I really wanted to do just a star treatment, and he would have been one of the three guys to be on it um, had, uh, uh, had, had we gone ahead and done it. But anyway. Uh, real good game for Michael Pierce, having a great year. And all mm-hmm. of the naysayers for Pierce at this point, I should be eating some crow right now. He's a player that I'm very curious about um, working into another deal. Um, I think he could be another good player to keep around. And uh, yeah, he's been, like like you said, I'm, I'm glad to hear it was even better maybe than I, I even even thought at first, like I thought he, I saw him in the backfield man. at 58, you keep seeing him, you know, um, just make a penetration. And uh, I'm, I'm keen to see more of him hopefully uh, for years to come. Yeah. I, I think that would be nice. And, you know, basically with all the pro- problems with Pierce have been durability the last few years and yeah. Pierce has played an unbelievable snap count this year. Basically they've, they've, they've abused the guy. Let's, let's just look at what for the season he has right now, right, uh, this game. Yeah. And for the season, he's played 59% of the snaps, which is way too high for a nose tackle. You shouldn't, you shouldn't do that. But he's not just a nose tackle. He's in there on, on pass rush situations. They want him in there with Matt Abike on these pass rush situations. They almost never kick an outside linebacker inside, not right now. And uh, that is total number of snaps in. Okay, well, here's some good data on both these. He's played 197 snaps. That's almost 40 per game he's played so far. So 59% of the snaps. When he has not been in, the Ravens have allowed 4.7 yards per play. When he has been in, the Ravens have allowed 3.5 yards per play. Hmm. So that's not all him, obviously. There's other things going on, but that's still pretty fantastic. Um, sack, the sacks as a percentage of, of passing are the highest of any individual on the Ravens if you set a snap count minimum. So let's see. We have Phillips says 20%, but that's like one out of five or two out of ten or something. And uh, it's one out of five passing, actually. But otherwise, Pierce is the highest of the of the Ravens. Mm. So. Yeah, I thought he had a, an excellent game, and um, definitely, uh, I want to talk more about the defensive line. I think in this episode, since they kind of were left out. Uh, another one would be Matabike. Seventy three percent of the snaps in this game. Um, he was, you know, credited with that half sack. Saw him back making pressures and. Uh, Five tackles, um, three solo, two assisted, and uh, I thought I I thought he also had a really great game, but I'm, I am concerned about the the snap count. Yeah, very concerned about the snap count in general. I, I had Matabike for the sack, one other pressure, two other pressures, so two pressures plus the sack. Is that what you had too? Uh, that sounds about right. I I, I didn't um, count up the pressures, but yeah. Okay, so. Uh, definitely a nice uh, combination sack there with Queen, both working off some initial pressure from Clowney. It was positive. Uh, the two the two times otherwise he got pressure were both incomplete passes, which often means he's doing something to affect that throw uh, as that's mm-hmm. the definition of pressure sort of in a lot of ways. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but uh, right. but uh, did a good job. Matabike's kind of avoided penalties now for a couple of weeks. I think he had four penalties the first two weeks, which is absolutely – put in a deep hole, should have put him in a real deep hole with Harbaugh. I had one very noticeable conversation with him on the sideline. Uh, But since then, I think he's played quite well. And, uh, you know, definitely has looked better in these last three games, uh, both in terms of pressure and just just avoiding the big mistakes. Uh, He has some missed tackles on the year so far. So does Pierce for that matter. I think if you look at a – the deepness of the red indicated by a PFF score on the tackle rating of some of the Ravens defensive linemen, you miss gradation of importance of, of missed tackles. And what I mean by that is a missed tackle in the backfield that retracts a running back or gets the quarterback turned 180 degrees is usually going to result in something good anyway. Even if you miss a sack, um, it's usually not going to result in anything but probably a sack. And sometimes right. it's it's a bigger sack or it's even an interception that you get on, on the play. But anyway, he's had some he's he said a couple of missed tackles, neither of which has ended up in being any kind of a big play. And that ends up being a big red number for him. And that's true of, of both Pierce and to a lesser extent of Matabike as well. 
Yeah, indeed. I think uh, a lot of those missed tackles have been also in the, like you said, in the run game, redirects the running back towards one of our linebackers and they take care of business. So it hasn't been too terrible when they do miss tackles. And I think also, um, you know, it's one of those things, like they might not have the best angle, right? I, it's curious what a, what a missed tackle, what, what a missed tackle is, but they were contributing to bring the guy down and getting in their way. So all, all important stuff. All right. Um, I'll pick a player and I might stay on the defensive line here and, and, and go with Travis Jones. I thought he had a yeah. fine game. Mm-hmm. Uh, did not play a lot of snaps the entire game. Uh, let's see what he had. He did here. not. Yeah, it's 33%, 20. 22. Okay, so 20 on yours. Yeah. yeah it's, uh, tw- 20 does not include the penalties. So, so, or, and it also does not include the five kneel downs Neals. in one game. Five kneels in one game. Yeah, I know. I know. Yeah, but uh, <laughs> yeah, they had. Uh, he, he, so he's in there for 20 snaps. I, I am am happy about the way he played. I thought he played very well. And for the first time in this game that I noticed it, they were actually using the Pierce and Jones 1-3 tandem, okay. uh, which gives gives Jones a nice opportunity to, to, to do things. Jones uh, was, I believe, involved in a couple of the stunt plays. They really are trying to see what they can get out of him as a pass rusher, two of them. The first was an incomplete, and he had a pressure on the play. The second one went for 12 yards. Um, so anyway, not, not extreme results in either direction in terms of how that went, but it's nice to see them trying things with him in there at that three tech spot. Um, and it's positive and, uh, happy with the way he's played against the run, generally speaking, and, uh, still looks like a, a very good prospect to me. Yeah. He had a nice, uh, penetration. I recall on run play broke up that, you know, opportunity for them and only three or three percent of the snaps so i would love to see him get more snaps and and decrease the workload of maddie bk and pierce i think he has the skill set to play both of those uh positions well and i want to see him contribute more just sort of like the longevity of these players and their like motor going forward yeah that's a great point and he can he can actually take snaps off the plates of both of those players at a high level and maybe not quite as high as either Pierce or Matt Abike can do this season. But I still think Jones will be a star, and I think if the, he will make both of those players better with a little bit more rest um, as, as time goes on. Yeah, I'm in complete agreement. And I, I definitely am curious why his snap count's been so low. I don't know if you have his total snaps for the year yet. I'll but uh, yeah, I think I, it's been low every game, basically. And there might've been one game where he, he sniffed like the mid forties, but I just, I don't know what they're doing there. I, I I'm, I'm legitimately surprised he's not playing more. So one one Oh five, I have one Oh nine, including penalties that he's been in. Uh, that doesn't, it still wouldn't include like kneels and spikes and such. There's a few of those, mm-hmm. um, but that's not much. Uh, they've been more effective with him not in there, which is, which is one of the things it's just, he's kind of the reverse from Pierce snap count probably not high enough to really get frustrated by it, but 4.8 with him in there, 3.6 with him not in there. So kind of the opposite of Pierce. Yeah. Um, do you have a run pass splits by chance? I do. So he was, he's been in there for 44 rush attempts and 61 pass attempts for the one Oh five. Okay. So, Interesting. But, oh, that's um, yes. Yeah, so you need to know the overall to make sure if that's the thing. So Pierce has been in for 128 and uh, sorry for, 69 and 128. So not quite a two to one relationship. Matabike 77 and 150 is almost a two to one relationship. Mm-hmm. Um, the other guy who's been in for a lot of run snaps is Urban, who's been 31 and 35. And, yeah. and Washington, 59 and 70. So those guys yeah. tend to not be in there on third down uh, yeah. or on obvious passing downs. Yeah, they're, they're, they're more often, yeah, like you said, in the run plays. So interesting. All right. Pick us a linebacker, and unless you want to talk about Brent Urban or something. No, let's talk about Kyle Van Noy. I thought he had a quiet game after what was a, a pretty, uh, you know, great first appearance. Um, I think he had one pressure event, and uh, but otherwise just didn't uh, appear too often. Just even in the game, I felt like guys like uh, Harrison had a bigger game than he did. Uh, yes, I would. I would. I did not think this game was nearly as good as from Van Noy, and he played more snaps, I think, this week than he did in the opener. Like the opener, he was in the twenties or nineteen or something. Played twenty nine snaps this t- this time, and um, it's not like the Ravens were bad with him in there. They held they held him to four point eight yards, but I wouldn't draw a lot from that. They had two of their sacks with him in there. 
I have him for two pressures, neither of which led to bigger things, but an incomplete and a 13 yard play, not a lot to be drawn from that. They didn't get a lot of value from his pressure. Mm -hmm. Uh, Is this right again? If this is an exact match, I'm going to be surprised, but I have to check this. Okay. For the second consecutive game, I know I've never seen this before. They had exactly seven rush attempts uh, when Van Noy was in the game with exactly eight yards gained. <laughs> eight yards on seven carries in the first game, 1.1. Eight yards, seven carries the second game, 1.1. Um, I, I know that I, I the reason I remembered it was because PFF gave him a terrible run grade in his first game. And he he was in there for you know games where he only gave up 1.1. You know, the, the team didn't give up any yardage. And he drew a holding call to negate the only big play while he's in there, which was only about eight yards. But he drew a right. holding call. That's you know, that's big. Yeah. And uh that frustrating anyway. But uh but it, it it boy, I mean, you look at how the Ravens overall have done the have handled the run. I think he's you would have to say he's been pretty good at holding that edge. Um and he seems to do I wouldn't say he's he holds the edge extremely physically, but he's a pretty good positional holder of the edge, whereas guys like Robinson tend to be more out of position, less willing to close down the edge to the minimum uh, spacing that is mm-hmm. effective. Uh, it, it's, and sometimes that's that's a, in a case where you're not blocked on the play. So anyway, Van Noy, I, so far, happy with the signing, really looks good. We had a question come in about this. Why don't we hit that right now out of the out of the out of the hashtag film study mailbag? Sure. So Brad McGowan at McBradley says, "Is it concerning for the future of our young edge guys that it seems all the aging vets the Ravens have brought in in the past couple of years are immediately more effective? I assume he means more effective than the young guys who are, have done less." I think it was concerning last year. I would say this year I'm actually not that concerned because. It looked to me like OA was a, a new a new player, and unfortunately he had the injury that set him back now. But I, I I liked what I was seeing out of OA, and I thought that you know that off season with Doctor Rush has really paid dividends, and the work he's put in as well. And I, I was I was optimistic about him, um, and I hope that he gets back soon. No no clear timeline on that. Ojabo, um, he's now potentially out for the year, which is absolutely devastating for him. Um, and also, of course, for the team, second round pick who, you know, was a red shirt this first year, essentially, this is really problematic for us being able to see him grow. And I think that's just tough. You know, he had a great preseason. Uh, well, he didn't actually do great in the preseason, but he had a good camp. Everyone was talking oh. about him in camp. And I was concerned about the preseason. And then he comes in and had a, a strip sack. You know, he, he showed some flashes. So you thought, okay, like that's trending upward but then of course he had the injury and it was kind of quiet um you know leading up to it so this is this is just really unfortunate circumstance i don't think anyone was expecting much out tavius robinson you know given his his draft pedigree but i think i will say like cutting ahead maybe to him that guy has been hustling and and really showing leaps uh each time he comes out there maybe not so much this game and from last game but i feel like he's exceeded my expectations which were admittedly low uh in, in his appearances uh, there isn't anything I can say about Tavius Robinson to be really positive at this point. So he's he's came in and he worked worked with Chuck Smith. So that's a good thing. He should have gotten some additional opportunity. He's getting a trial by fire, which is wonderful. But he's he's not like he's really succeeding in this trial by fire as of right now. So not as a pass I, rusher for sure. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I've got to see more, or as a run defender for that matter. I mean, honestly, I don't. I, I he, he may have avoided some of the things he was doing worse earlier in the season in terms of, of letting himself get run out of plays, but he's just not that great a run defender. And I, you know, I didn't expect him to be, but they've got him now playing mostly early downs and Van Noy playing later downs. Um, or, or actually, yeah, it, it can't be Connie and Van Noy. It could be the other way around. Um, but, but anyway, the, the guys they want in on obvious passing situations are Clowney and Van Noy. They, they don't really yeah. want Tavius Robinson on the field. They're not doing anything to kick him inside, which tells you a little bit about how well he's playing because it means like a player like Michael Pierce is basically eating his snaps inside. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah, no, agreed. I thought he would get more opportunity inside that he's been seeing. 
All right, let me go. A, a guy I think has been playing really well in a limited role so far is Harrison. I thought had another yeah. really good game this uh, this week, uh, doing what he needs to do. Just he sets the edge exceptionally well. He's been a guy they can depend on for early down run defense and what they want out of early down pass defense. Here's one of the other things about Harrison that is really nice with the way the Ravens have chosen to play defense this year. So when they want to play cover two, when your outside linebacker could do a good job diagnosing screen passes, he has a lot of value. And so I think that's been a positive of Harrison. They have, they obviously, whether you're Cincinnati or you ever, whoever you are, you're trying to throw the ball to the outside and quickly a lot versus the Ravens to try and get that ball out of trouble and not have to throw deep. And when they've done it, it's just he's been one of the guys who's come through in the clutch with good good plays and coverage. Uh, he had one stop for about a three or four yard gain, and I think in this one, one tackle it was a defensive win, and uh, just another on the pile at this point. But I thought he's played pretty good defense so far this year, and um, really fits with the Ravens scheme. Harrison has exceeded all my expectations coming into this year. He's definitely been playing really well in all those things that you mentioned, sniffing out screens, being available. Uh, I guess in that, like, you know, behind line of scrimmage passes are just like short passes, diagnosing them, uh, breaking up run plays. I thought he, I think he's been playing great. And um, this is one of the biggest snap counts he's gotten in a game, uh, 50% of snaps, at least according to the official game book. And I, uh, I have nothing but positive things to say. You know, he he's a guy that's uh, playing a position that wasn't what we drafted him for, right? He's playing now more edge. Yep. But I, I think he's been playing at a really high level, and then you add in his special teams contributions. This could be a player who is an NFL survivor and is on the Ravens for a while. That's you know, that's the the great thing about this. I don't think anybody's going to be looking to sign Malik Harrison away from the Ravens at the end of this season. I think the Ravens, if they go to him and they say two years, three million, mm -hmm. you know, we can give you seven hundred fifty thousand of that up front, and otherwise pay you the vet minimum for 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 two years. I think they get him, and I think they got a core special teamer. They got a guy who can make contributions on on defense, and you know, this is the upside of about the most he can play. But if he's if he's your base defense outside linebacker, which basically is what he's become for the Ravens at this point, plus a few others, a few other nickel snaps as well in this, and he can play at the level he has right now. He's an easy, easy choice to keep. Easy, easy choice. Yeah, I agree. Uh, and, and really saving his career, there was conversations that, you know, he might be out of the league if he didn't step up, and and here he is. I'll bring up another player who kind of fits into the same category, and, and we didn't see him in this game other than on the very big fumble on special teams, but Jeremiah Moon, who played a lot of snaps against Cleveland, did not mm -hmm. play a single defensive snap. And there was not an outside linebacker who returned in this game, but he played 22 snaps against Cleveland. Um, and you know, certainly didn't play poorly, but uh, uh, you know, for whatever reason, he's out this game. Harrison is the one who ended up eating most of his snaps. I would say Van Noy probably got a few too. Um, didn't have anybody who played an absolute ton of snaps among the outside linebackers. So Clowney led the team with 37, as I account for them, which would have been probably about 60% of the snaps, as you would see other, uh, in other sources. Yeah, I was surprised by that. Um, I don't have much other to say than that. I, I don't know. Like you said, I didn't think he played poorly per se. So um, I definitely think that he's a player that I would rather not see on the field though. That's uh, I would, I would definitely hope that these other outside linebackers get to play or that these other ones um, that we, that did get snaps this game were able to play. I think moving along a player, I would love to kind of spotlight again in case you didn't listen to the first episode, but again, highly recommend you do is Millette. This was a revenge game for him coming back as a, uh, you know, a former Pittsburgh Steeler. They didn't want him. And this guy, I, you know, exceeding expectations for me, playing quite well in his uh, in his um, appearances for the Ravens so far after dealing with an injury in camp. Two pass defense uh, in the end zone on back to back plays where they were trying to take advantage of him, and then of course his very clean um, nickel blitz that was pretty well disguised, able to go in there untouched and and get a solid QB hit and sack. This is a this is a kind of player that gives you a little bit of flexibility to see what you want to do with stone or uh, rather with Hamilton and and stone. Yeah. And stone, yeah. 
that was a, a mistake, but the, not, not entirely. <laughs> so yeah, that I, I'm just, I'm over the moon about this guy. And this is something that's really great for the Ravens who for so many years have had all these injury problems to be able to say, okay, we have depth in these places. We have optionality um, for who's going to play in these positions. It's, it's a huge help because you know, someone's going to get hurt. And when they do, we have somebody. So not every position, but in some of these key positions, that, that is the case. The mullet addition was a big one. I honestly, I, I was at the same position. I think you mentioned this in the first show. Is the guy even going to stick around? Because he wasn't in camp. The Ravens had gone through this whole series of um, slot corners, starting with Brandon Stevens and going to Pepe and then Ardarius. And Ardarius played so lights out during the preseason. So you thought, okay, they find they find their guy and he's the easiest of all. And they did give the job to him. And Mollett has still made the 53, which was even surprising to me because they had to cut Caillou Kelly to do that. And yeah, they yeah. thought he would make it through the practice squad, but they were taking a, a pretty big risk uh, to get it done. Of course, the draft pick was a big risk too. That was, you know, people, <laughs> people say, oh, it's just a lottery ticket in the fifth round. No, screw that. It was an important pick. Yeah. Uh, They're all important picks. Yeah. So anyway, uh, great that Mollett is playing at the level he's playing right now. And, and he certainly seems like a bargain now at the price. Yeah, for sure. And and one thing I want to talk about with the, the the lottery ticket thing, not only like like you've mentioned in other shows, are we you know we think we're better at it, right, with selecting players, but there's there's too much talent that is in late rounds and undrafted for you to be whiffing on these. You can even just, even if you just want to call them priority waiver claims, which they might be by the sixth and seventh round. If we're being honest, they're just priority waiver claims. They matter. <laughs> they absolutely matter. So go get your guys get good ones. <laughs> like th- this is very important. You can't, I-, I take every, like, you know, I play dynasty fantasy football and people like hate fifth round picks. I'm like, give them to me. I love them. I- I'm over here, like trying to find the best guy. And like, I think the Ravens are the same way. Like this is not, they're no joke. And, it- and that let's make it, I think in my opinion, even more disappointing when they miss on these players. Cause I, I, they, they seem to do well in these undrafted free agents, but then some of these later picks lately have not been quite it. So I'm, I'm wondering what's going on here. Yeah, so they get Keaton Mitchell with a, with a UDFA tag, and hopefully he's going to be good because we, what we've seen in the preseason was certainly all good. Yeah. But, you know, they draft Ben Mason, and they just don't have their heads on straight in terms of what's going to happen when they cut him, which I don't know if they knew right away was going to happen or if they were still thinking he was going to replace Ricard. If he's just Ricard insurance, it's way too high a price to pay for that. Yeah. If he's if he's just a fullback, it's probably too high a price to pay for it. So I, I – I don't know how you put the pieces together on a player like Ben Mason and say he's draftable. I, I just do not have, know how they sure, do it. Sure, but you can even go as far – I mean, I don't know. This is not really the place to start bashing some of these later round picks. But, like, I mean, you just look at the traits of even Caillou Kelly, and it was like, well, right. what, what, what do they see? You look at – even at – like, I know Salah had some, you know, positive spin during the preseason, but I'm very concerned about him going forward. We'll see if he's able to, you know, improve with another year of – weight room and, and coaching and whatnot. But uh, the, the, that's like, that was a pick right away that I kind of scratched my head a little bit. Um, I mean, shoot, I think when they went back and traded back in to get Voorhees, that was the more astute pick. <laughs> yes, that's by, by far. And that's why I say about a seventh round pick that you got. Now he was, he was drafted as seven. If they win that pick, not only will it be a huge pick, it could be a huge pick taking him away from the Browns. You don't really know, yeah. but, but you know, a six has a lot more value than a seven. So even if you haircut a six by a year, you probably still have more value. You know, it's if you look at JJ points, yeah. if you have any kind of a percentage reduction that isn't 90, because it shouldn't be 90, <laughs> you're going from one year to the next, you probably get a, a you know, a better deal out of that. I, I don't understand the the Browns making that trade in division. I, I do not understand it. I think it was a big mistake. And, and, and if, <laughs> if it pays off for the Ravens, it's really going to pay off for the Ravens. And mm. it would be kind of just the opposite of what the Browns did with their extra sixth round pick. And do you remember what the, the Browns in 2006, and there's a lot of people out there who don't remember that draft anymore. It's, it's too long ago. People are, you know, 20 years old, 25 years old now listening. And they don't, they don't know the whole situation with Alodi Nada, but in that draft, the Ravens uh, let a sixth round pick go to move up from spot 13 to spot 12 to draft Alodi Nada. The Browns got Aaron Rodgers' season is officially over, but yours has just begun at my bookie. 
NFL, college ball, and the brand new cash out system gives you options to bet and win all season long. First two legs of your parlay hit, cash out early and place another bet or let it ride for a chance at a bigger payday. Join us at MyBookie for an entire season filled with daily odd boost, same game parlays, and huge prize pool contests. Right now, MyBookie has a no-strings-attached cash bonus that lets you deposit and withdraw quick. Use the promo code RAVENS on your first deposit of $50 or more, and you can receive up to $200 in cash instantly credited to your MyBookie account. That's promo code RAVENS to claim your cash bonus now. You can bet anything, anytime, anywhere, only with MyBookie. Cam Wembley by dropping one spot. It was an ex-Ravens personnel guy who let them make the trade. One of the worst imaginable value trades, you can say. And it was supposedly competition, but the, but Philadelphia supposedly wanted Broderick Bunkley, who I don't know if people really remember him. He was in the league for a few years. He wasn't terrible, but he certainly wasn't a no Nada. Um, yeah. But he, he uh, uh, was the guy they drafted at 14. And the Browns tried to bluff the Ravens and say, well, you're, you're – we're going to trade in Philadelphia then. The Ravens said, go ahead and do it because they probably knew that, that, you know, Philadelphia was more likely to like Bunkley, or maybe they said, you know what? Bunkley's okay with us too. We're, we're pretty much not, uh, we don't have a problem with either of this. And anyway, they got, they got Nada. They got the guy they really wanted. Yeah. And the rest is history. And, and except for the fact that the Browns got Babatunde Oshinowo from that. And we went to the, I, I'll tell the story once, even though I know there's a lot of people who know it by heart by now. But we went to a game at Cleveland that year that Tucker won on a 52-yard field goal, 50 to 14, as time oh. expired. Actually, not as time expired, but just before time expired. Anyway, the, sure. the, the two guys in front of me, one of them is sitting there with an Oshinowo jersey. And I'm going, how did you even get that jersey? He's just drafted this year in the sixth round. I mean, how, how, I had it made custom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I would say in the way that the draft's gone, too, even one pick up trade, I mean that doesn't that doesn't even compute on the JJ value to get a six round pick. That, that makes no sense. Um, you really have to know that you have two guys you can't choose between <laughs> on your end to like take anything like that. That that's just wild to me. So yes, yeah, it's, it's fifty points. I mean, if JJ value, so you know, fifty points is like a what about a late fourth or something? It's it's, yeah, it's, it's a lot better than that. So anyway. Which is, it's it, yeah, it's a whole lot better. I mean, the level of talent in the fourth round compared to the sixth is, is pretty pretty dramatic. Right. All right. Whose turn is it now? Let's keep going here. Uh, how about you. the game Roquan had? Sure. Yeah. Another another big one. I mean, Roquan, he, he makes my list of star talent almost every week when I put up the articles. And just game after game, we see him making plays against in coverage having a bunch of tackles, a bunch of defensive wins, and usually having an impact on the pass rush as well on a game-by-game basis. Now, this game, I don't believe he had a single pass rush event. That was my recollection. Uh, I have to look at it. He did, he did pass rush, uh, but he might not yeah, register an event. Okay, so yeah. they've got him. The PFF has him for one hurry. I don't think I did, but I've lost my sheet here for a second as I'm doing the game. So I'll have to... Yeah, I didn't have him for a single pressure event. So they've, they've got one for him somewhere. That's good. Um, but just guys making tackles, 11 tackles in this game. I didn't have him for a miss. I'm sure there's other services somewhere that might have. But, uh, uh, you know, making a decent number of defensive stops. It's often plays where he assists on, where there's a defensive win as well. It doesn't have to be one where he necessarily gets the solo tackle. But uh, he's just become such a much better player since he got here. Uh, than he was when he was in uh, in Chicago. Super steady. This is it's getting like not boring, but it's just like expected. It's getting almost like Lamar. Like you don't mention Lamar because Lamar did Lamar things. He did well, right? Uh, this is the level that Roquan's definitely gotten to for the fan base at at inside linebacker, and it's just been tremendous. Like we talked about in the first episode, his play in addition to Queens is what's making this cover two so lethal. And it's not what teams are used to because, you know, you're lucky to have one good inside linebacker. To have two is, a, is a, just a huge blessing. So this group is, is tremendous. Um, and it's just, become, it's just become status quo, which is phenomenal. But it's just truth. Like, we, that's what we expect, and that's what we've been getting. 
Yeah, great, great downhill play. You got very high quality now of tackling with very little yards after the catch uh, in that area, which is a lot of what they do. The Ravens play a very soft coverage scheme, which basically keeps most plays in front of them and gives these linebackers a better um, ability to drop and make that area that is normally the weakness of cover two, which is right behind both linebackers in what I call the play action zone between level two and three, more dangerous um, because those guys can get a hand on the football. And when you can get a hand on the football, you can intercept the football or you can tip the football. They'll have somebody else intercept it. Um, or you can just knock the pass down. And that's pretty, pretty damn good as well too. So they've, they've done a lot of things well. And I would agree. I think that, that, uh, you know, it, it definitely, the cover two is fantastic for limiting the space that our weak corners have to go after. And I'm, I'm, I say that because it was the perceived weakness at the start of the season that doesn't seem to be a weakness now, mm. but the, the, they've really helped those corners out in terms of limiting their responsibilities to some very select space. And that, could, that only works if also you have good linebackers to, to, to play inside as well. So been great for that. And they've been obviously great fill players as well. They have been. Um, I guess another player it might be worth talking about, um, is, is Hamilton, you know, sure. <laughs> he's a, a star. Uh, I I'm loving everything I'm seeing from him so far. I saw a couple plays where he had solid tackling right around the line of scrimmage, uh, when he was playing the nickel role, um, just saw him, the amount of space he commands, like he's so long and lanky. He's just, uh, he I don't know. I feel like if if you had like a circle for his zone of impact, like not necessarily a zone he's playing, but like his zone of impact, it's a, it's a very large circle similar to Roquan and and PQ and how they're playing. He just is impacting so much of the field when he's there, uh, particularly close to the line of scrimmage. And I think it's just so much more noticeable than um, the impact he has on the on the back end. Um, I think it's just because he's able to be around for tackles. He's been such a sure tackler. And like we were discussing in episode one, I I think he's going to be a big chess piece in beating Henry and slowing down that running attack, which also includes uh, Tajay Spears, which was one of, my, one of my favorite running backs in this in this year's class and has been quite explosive for them. So definitely a, a, a combination that, um, that should help the Ravens. It is, is very little I can say other than than Hamilton contributed two tackles for loss again during this game. I want to pass, I want to run. It can be in anything. He did miss a tackle over by the what would be the right sideline from the offense's perspective when he when he kind of ran through a play. Uh, I like the way he goes uh, plays through the action. So uh, eighty the 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 tight end Washington Darnell Washington by the way looked like crap in this game against. <laughs> yeah, he's he's enormous. But he just looks he looks completely ungainly in terms of what he brought to this game for the Ravens. So uh coming uh, off injury too. Oh, is that it? Did you just come back in this game? Uh he got I think he was hurt um going into the week, but yeah. It might have been okay. just I, not just a concussion, but it might have been a concussion. Um yeah. I can't I'm trying to remember now. Yeah, this is I'm looking at this. This is the most snaps he's played in a game. And yeah, no, he, by a large margin too. Yeah, yeah. With with Firemuth out, he he stepped up. Yeah, right. But uh, he he does not. He doesn't really seem to have the ideal. Um, maybe it's athleticism. He certainly is not as refined as a blocker. And he's a guy I looked at in the draft, and I said this guy is going to be a, a, an offensive tackle convert because it makes all the sense in the world. He's got these enormous long arms. Um, if he becomes a threat as a receiver, well. You know, that's the only thing that could keep him away from doing that. But I think it, it would be, it'd be natural for him to put on about 40 pounds right now and play offensive tackle. I think he could do it. And if he goes through the normal process of doing it through the weight room and it's good weight as opposed to bad weight, uh, there's still time for him to develop into that. Yeah, he's a, he's been a strange player. I've been keeping an eye on him uh, as an interested party in, in Dynasty. Um, mm-hmm. But, uh, yeah, he, I, he hasn't had any explosive plays. Um, I think he only has one catch on the season, uh, at least coming into this game. And and he also just, when I was talking to a, a Steelers fan that you know watches him in every game, just he's he's not, I guess like he's not moving in space particularly well right now, like you said, and it's just not it's not quite working out so far. But okay. there's not, there's plenty of time. Tight ends a a long one to develop usually. 
we were talking about we were talking about Hamilton in in this sense, but I thought Hamilton outmaneuvered Washington a fair amount in this game. So, oh, for sure, um, yeah. But I, 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 I love you know you have two tackles for minus one in a game by Hamilton, and yet he's not in the most advantaged position to do that because he only I think ended up playing sixteen snaps of nickel in this game. Just you know, obviously he had the incredible first half the previous weeks where he gets three sacks in in the very first half. Why wouldn't you try to do everything possible to keep Hamilton at nickel? Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a valid question. I think um, you have Mollette playing well, but I think Hamilton's another, another level, right? So it, it's definitely an interesting challenge, but by doing that, you're making the choice of basically bringing Williams into the game, given their current depth and injuries, unless they get like, creative with their corners. Right. Yep. So they'd have to they'd have to move somebody back to safety and that obviously there there will be questions. I think if if Humphrey I think here's what I think it will take. I think Humphrey will have to get beat for at least one more touchdown pretty badly. For or for one more big play, I'll say pretty badly, before Harbaugh and McDonald come to the conclusion that maybe we need to move Humphrey to safety for this year. He can go back to corner in a future year when his foot is right. But right now, things are just not right. He's a physical player. He's a smart player. We want him on the field. We want cornerbacks, quarter, opposing quarterbacks thinking about him being on the back end, lurking back there, looking for the football. And maybe it's the kind of thing that even makes him a better cornerback long time to play half a season at safety or a full season at safety, if that's what it ends up being. But I, I don't – I. I want to be wrong about this. I so want to be wrong about this and have Humphrey all, next week look like the Humphrey of old. Physical line of scrimmage, yep. Ravens playing cover two, minimizing the responsibilities. And then when he has them and he ends up on an island, he looks great. But if it doesn't work out, you know, I, I would have a pretty quick trigger finger on this one. Yeah, it's an interesting predicament we found ourselves in with the safety depth. So um, creative, creative solutions might be necessary given you know the cap situation and pers- personnel we already have. So let's see what we can figure out. All right. You got another corner you want to talk about? Um, or anybody for that matter. I mean, yeah, no, we can talk about corner. That's easy. Uh, we haven't talked about Stevens yet in this episode. Played 100% of the snaps. And um, he, he's just uh, – he's been the biggest um, – Year over year improvement player, I think, for the Ravens this year. I think uh, another you know, contender would be Harrison, but I think Stevens is playing at a more high leverage p- position, playing more snaps, and and also just has just made a better jump. I think what he, I think he's playing now to the level of what they dreamed of. I think this is like he might have more ceiling, but this is I think the level of play that they probably ever expected with that late third round pick on a you know four star running back <laughs> going into right. college. So I, I'm, I'm so pleased that this, this worked out for him in the long term. He moved around the formation a lot. And it, it appears to me now that this is a NFL corner who will be in the league for probably another, you know, four or five years. So I think he, he's made himself a career uh, out of this year and uh, very proud of him. Yeah, you know, I, that's exactly the correct way to state it. I, I don't know that he'll make it to the end of his second contract, but I think he, he stands a good chance to make some money. I don't think he's moving again. And I think if I were him, I'd want to stay right where I am. I would not want to go back to safety. I would not want to go to slot nickel. I, I, I don't want to go to strong safety. I don't even want to be a free safety. If they offered me that, I'd want to be, a, I'd want to be an outside corner. And he's got a chance to really get paid there. Um, you know, this game was an interesting one for him because they, they tried to pick on him a little bit uh, by throwing the ball to Pickens. And mm-hmm. Pickens out-heighted him on some balls. But Stevens was right there, right there with him stride for stride on a lot of these plays. Uh, he gave up four, four catches among eight targets. So it wasn't a whole lot in this game. And then that was for, let me just see what I've got here. Yeah. Four to eight for 63 yards. It's not a great game in terms of, you know, it's over seven, uh, 7.8, 7.9 yards per target. But, uh, you know, a lot of it was was Pickens being right there. And he did, a, I thought, a, a yeoman's job of being the best at trying to deny space for Pickens that he could be. It's just I'm a little unfortunate that Pickens was a, had a good toe-tap game. Sometimes with players like that or T. Higgins, 
there's just not a lot you can do as a defender. It's interesting that this Steelers team is so known for the over his shoulder catches that the Ravens use different um, drills than they normally do to try to practice for this. And, uh, you know, I think it was mixed results, right? <laughs> but um, I, I did that, not. What's, I didn't know this. What, where did you see this reported? Uh, now I'm trying to remember because I thought you would ask. Um, no problem. No problem. If you don't remember, nobody. nobody yeah, I, I, I think uh, I think it was referenced on um, on the Vault podcast, but I could be wrong. I have, I have to think about. It. I can't remember who uh, who I heard it from, but that was what uh, came out. Maybe um, maybe it was one of the. Um, I think actually maybe Harbaugh mentioned in his presser. They ran drills. Okay. I, I, I have to, I have to, I'm, th- I'm trying to think on this now. Okay. The, no, no sweat. Um, I'm just, I'm just interested. Whoever's, there shouldn't be oh, anyone who's. I got it. It was, it was, it was, uh, it was Ryan Mink actually in the lounge podcast. That's okay. Well, he can get away with it because he's a Ravens employee. <laughs> no, nobody else who's watching the Ravens at, at practice should be talking about should that be, kind of stuff. Right. 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 Yep. Uh, yep. Yep. That's who it was. Okay. Um. All right. Um, let's see. Oh, Worley is, of course, on IR. I, I, I guess one guy I want to talk about is Yasin a little bit because he, you know, got the got the bench uh, in this game. Certainly has played very well on the season so far. And just to give you an idea, um, in terms of yards per target, he's right around four point zero for the year. Um, and. I don't have much more to go on that than that. He has 83 rush plus pass plays for the whole year. Ravens have given up 4.6 yards per play when he's been in, only 3.8 when he's been out. But I think he's, he's in terms of his own personal contributions to that, he's looked a lot better than that. He's looked very physical, obviously, when they played. I would have thought that he wouldn't immediately lose all his snaps, that you'd be playing rotationally on both sides with Humphrey taking snaps from Stevens and with Yasin and Darby trading off snaps as well. And if you want to go some with Humphrey on that left side as well and give Stevens you know, two-thirds of the snaps and Humphrey half and then whatever works out fractionally for the other two, that'd be fine as well. But I didn't think anybody was going to get zero in this game. Um, and and it just seems a little odd to me that Yasin hit the hit the pine after after four games. I, too, am surprised. You know, I knew going into the game that this was a possibility that uh, some sort of rotation would happen. But wasn't I never would have dreamed of zero snaps for you, and that that is a surprise for me. I guess it really just shows the confidence they have in Stevens, if anything, that they didn't they didn't bring him in. But uh, sheesh, having a guy like Yasin in your back pocket who's not getting snaps is it's a good problem to have. But uh, yeah, he's been playing quite well this year. Um, once he got back from his injury, yep, yep. So happy with that. I, that's going to about do it for me, Geno Stone. By the way, let's let's talk about him for a second because yeah. we talked about him on the first show. Some he's been the best Ravens deep safety so far this year in in mm-hmm. terms of what he's got. He's got two interceptions, but it's not just that. He's just anticipating the ball very well, reading the ball very well, playing that half field cover two role that he does uh, at a high level. And unfortunately, Williams' return kind of pushed him out of the game. Williams was not quite himself in terms of playing with one arm and and not really looking right. Uh, so that was an, an additional kind of a negative thing about this. And when I look back at this game and I see what happened, you know, first of all, I want Stone in there as half of a cover two, regardless of who he's got to replace. So if he's got to replace Hamilton, so that Hamilton can come with nickel and it's and it's Stone and Williams on the back end, that's fine. But they need they need to have you know, some sort of good cover two combination that allows Hamilton to move up front at this point. Um, and if it, if it honestly, if it meant somebody like Humphrey has to be moved, I'm okay with that too. But stone, in my opinion, right now is too good a player not to be playing on the back end of, of the Ravens defense. I agree with you. I will also add that stone is a key contributor as is, um, Hamilton on special teams. And this is very concerning to me, given the fact of how incredibly important they are to the defense and, uh, what the, what the situation is behind them. So, I don't know how you get them out of those snaps, but it is a concern for me. And uh, yeah, I, yeah, so I, I would ha- go ahead. Is Hamilton still playing special teams? I, I yeah, twenty percent of snaps. Okay, I think so, he's on the, the punt team. I'm trying to find him in here in the game book. Yeah, he had seven seven snaps. Okay, 
So, I mean, that's, that's obviously not ideal. Um, if he's on the punt team and not the, if he's on the kickoff team, I almost care less because the kickoff team, there are almost no kick returns anymore. So those sevens are seven touchbacks out to the 25, no big deal. And no team is trying to return kicks right now. Have you been noticing this? So almost yeah. no, no attempts to pooch anymore because you can fair catch inside the 25. And I, it was you and me who did the show on the, on the suggested Rule changes. rules changes. Yeah. And we said, this is never going to pass. This will never pass in a million yeah. years. <laughs> Just the worst play. Yeah. I, I can't believe I can't believe what they're doing. So like I said in the in the one show, I'd rather them do the XFL kickoff rules than than this. And uh you know, who knows? Maybe they'll change it again. I mean, it seems like they're open for they, they want to do something with the play, so it wouldn't shock me if it changes again. What was the what was the XFL rule that was different? Because it's it, it, they, they like line up at the um they line up like 10 yards apart at like the 25 or 30. Uh so they kick the ball and then like once it's caught they like start engaging in blocks and, okay uh, yeah so that's they're, they're not getting ahead of steam they're like separated by 10 yards and then they collide so it just looks like this like kicker all the way back a, a line of defenders and a, re- a returner or a, a line of defenders line of protectors and the returner okay huh okay which kind of makes the onside kick a, a question mark i don't know how that works you might have to like pre-declare an onside kick okay or maybe they don't even do it. I don't know. I, that's something. Actually, you know what? They might not do it because I think they have uh, mechanisms for retaining possession. Like a four, you go, you have a fourth and fifteen to start a drive or something. Yeah, yeah. Okay. That'd be that'd be good. I see your doggy in the background there. Hi, doggy. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, all right. So why don't we why don't we call it there? Uh, did we have a couple more mailbag questions we want to get to? Right. Let's see what else. We've got. Uh, so we have the mailbag we talked about earlier with the um. Uh, veteran outside linebackers. And then the the question I would want to bring up is we've been leaving a lot of timeouts in our pocket, and we've also been seeing a lot of operational errors by this team. Uh, the execution has been so lacking that in a, one of the podcasts I listened to, it was they said their attention detail is the level of a uh, toddler with a crayon and seeing a <laughs> white wall. Uh, <laughs> so like, <laughs> I thought that was kind of hilarious. Um, but yeah, they, uh, They've just been really struggling on these systematic, you know, um, you know, situational football problems. And the question is, like, do you start calling more timeouts? Now, I don't think that helps with the the fourth and two, um, because the whole point was to run down the clock. And we see plenty of offenses do plays like this all the time. Uh, but it just it's it's a getting to the point where it's just like I feel like this team almost needs to be babied through situational football. And it's, it's really concerning because this is stuff that should have been installed in August or July, not in October. Yeah. I, I think this was bad by the way. And one Twitter user suggested, and I think he's probably correct that the fourth and two snap came early from um, Linderbaum because he saw somebody jump off sides for the Steelers right. and he tried to catch him. And that would have been a five-year penalty. Would have been a great play if he'd done it. It's just it's such a negative play that he didn't. It's just it's well, you, and you can you draw it another way. You can have um, your guards or tackles flinch and point at him. Yeah, I feel like that's it's so much safer. Yeah, you go back five yards if you fail, but at least you get uh, an opportunity to kick the field goal from forty-seven instead of forty-two, which is fine. Um, it was just a. It was. It should have been like a never ever snap situation. If you really want to get that, you have to have the, the guards or tackles do it, and that's that's how it had to be. And and you look at the play. I think everyone was surprised that the ball got snapped, and then they ran like backyard football routes because I don't. I mean, you look at the play, and it's just like everyone's late to the ball, like late to move. No one knows what they're doing. It seemed like Zay just made something up. Like I mean, it was just a mess. It was an absolute mess. And Zay actually was open. Uh, mm-hmm. And then, and then he didn't get the ball there on schedule. Or whatever it was, it was a, it was a big mess. It was a, it was a big giant mess. And and it, it always makes me wonder if they had a play called. Like the way it actually played out. I mean, there obviously was a surprise factor, but like, um, it it almost seemed like not even a real play because <laughs> like what everyone how they moved. Like it just, yeah, it was it was really bad. Yeah. So it's it's one of those plays. I I you have a hard time getting back, and and obviously those those three points are really important in a game like this, you can't understate the importance in terms of what the difference in the game situation would have been, whether or not they're in that position to give up the touchdown, whether or not they felt like they had to get out of their normal cover two scheme 
to defend the field goal line the way they did. Yeah. We talked about that yeah. the first show. That's basically what they did. They would have been okay then having you know two safeties back and and letting them continue to play uh, what would have been, I guess, four down football to get closer to the end zone. So who knows? Maybe they still would have tried it to gamble to get off the field at that point. But uh, it was it was a it was a serious game changing moment for certain. We appreciate the question. I want to want to get to one from uh, at, at Ola Dynakin underscore four o- Ola, who said, "How do you think the DB rotation will be handled once Williams and Humphrey come back? Does Hamilton stay in the slot to keep Gino on the field? Do you think they keep Stevens at his corner too, or maybe rotating with Darby and Rakesset?" So I think we've answered a lot of that in this question. The Ravens certainly answered a lot um, in the game, us in the episode, I should say. But, uh, you know, Gino has got, got one of the short straws. The other short straw went to Rock Yassin, uh, hitting the pine on this. We really do appreciate the question. And I, I think we've got some other ideas on the table. But fair to say, everything's got to be up for discussion if we don't see Humphrey and Williams in particular come back stronger in this very next week. Yeah, definitely. Uh, it's an open Open. Uh, we saw the first version of it, but I think it's going to be continuing to mold as uh, time goes on. All right. And do we have one more, or is that it? We okay, right? You, t- you talked about it. it's the it's the if hard. Well, it, it, yeah, it was kind of a, a burner account for one zero. Was the one who asked the question about the you know was it even necessary to do that line of scrimmage play? It was twenty seconds left. You can uh, just you know, kick the field goal. They, they, the other, um, the Steelers probably would have kneeled immediately anyways. <laughs> they, they were having no success. Um, so probably what done, doesn't even matter. And I think, I think he's right. I mean, one thing that, uh, coach DC put a video on YouTube about that I thought was really interesting is that, um, he was saying like, we don't do enough risk mitigation as a, a team. I agree. With that. We've been putting our team in the very risky situations and to use your analogy, Ken, like, the against worst teams make small bets. Okay. Yes. Yes. They, 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 they just, they, they don't like, they just, they love to push the envelope for like really no reason. <laughs> um, and, and they've been completely screwing themselves. I mean, I was joking. Like we have no feet left. We've shot them too many times. Pretty well. All NFL coaches want to naturally play small pot poker because that's w- the way they grew up with the game is that you punt it on fourth and one and I- anywhere on your half of the field. And you certainly punt it on fourth and two anywhere on your own. Half. What are you crazy? You yeah. know, and of course, right. you know, modern analytics and modern math of any reasonable sort tells you, well, no, you don't necessarily do that. Offenses have now become too efficient. Uh, you know, it's, and, and uh, uh, you know, completion percentages are higher and you actually gain a lot in terms of expected win probability from going for it on a lot of situations. But that's not necessarily, you don't necessarily want a small expected points or even an expected win probability win if you're the better team. You want to play a smaller bet and basically play to lose, certainly in terms of expected points, even if there's a small expected win probability gain. Because if you do make that gamble, you're basically focusing more of the outcome in that game into a smaller number of plays. And that's exactly what the better team does not want to do. You want to avoid that situation. So uh, yeah. I appreciate you bringing that up for me. And and I'll, I can never risk or uh, pass up an opportunity to reinforce that when I hear it. It, it. And it was, I felt like a masterclass in this game. If, if, if you ever need to be convinced of it, Look no further than this game. I, I don't. I don't think it was as egregious against the Colts. To be honest, it was this game where they just found ways. The Colts game was just like turnovers. You know, you don't really, you can't really. I don't know, model those so to speak. But these decisions, you can. <laughs> and the and and it was it was putrid. Yeah. Anyway, bad situation. Uh, appreciate us going through a nice complete mailbag today. Alec, always fun to talk football with you. Great episodes, I thought. T- tell folks uh, where they can talk football with you online. You can find us at One Winning Pod on Twitter and One Winning Pod on Threads if you're so inclined. Uh, OneWinningPod.com for the the podcast. And uh, all I want to say is go O's. Let's get two more wins uh, on the road. Let's defy the odds and and make it make it a series. Yeah, let's make me feel bad if at all possible about missing that fifth game of the ALDS. And I I will be 
sending all the possible en positive energy I can back to uh, to you, Alec, to be in my seats. I will make sure uh, they are loud and proud and well represented. <laughs> all right. Very good. Uh, other folks out there, if you'd like to be on a film study short, hit me up. DMs are always open on Twitter. I'd love to hear from you. Always looking to meet new people for this guest-driven show. Alec, thanks again for joining me. Thanks so much, Ken. And we'll talk to you next time on Film Study.